structurally unstable than the other kind of fold bifurcation. Yeah. But it, this is only true near the bifurcation point because if we go far, then eventually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about, there are many concepts of stability. One is the stability of the dynamic system itself. That is the equilibrium point. So the uh, the bifurcation diagram is a diagram of how the equilibrium point changes as you change a parameter of the problem. Okay. So it's actually a path of equilibrium points as a parameter changes, and that will have a certain structure. That bifurcation diagram will have a certain structure. So the second concept of stability is the structural stability, whether that structure remains stable as I perturb a second parameter of the problem. Okay, so if I perturb a second parameter, the structure completely disappears, then we call that as structurally unstable, okay, which is different from dynamic stability of a given equilibrium point. Okay. Uh, so so, for example, the fold, uh, and this is where the catastrophe theory classification comes in help, helpful. Because a fold bifurcation is the most common bifurcation you will find in a one parameter problem. Okay. And uh, when you uh, have a second parameter and perturb it, the fold bifurcation will retain the fold. Okay. Whereas the pitchfork is occurring only at one particular value of the second parameter. If you put a bit, it falls apart. Okay, so if you go for a third parameter in a three-dimensional space, you will find that the pitchfork is a stable bifurcation as you put up the third parameter. But maybe if you have a fourth one, it will fall apart. So Rene Thom's classification of the catastrophe theory was basically trying to identify what is the nature of the singularity. The simplest one is the four. Then you have Number of others we will see today: transcritical bifurcation, uh, uh, half bifurcation, uh, supercritical, and subcritical. Which is something that I missed last time, so that's why I have this figure again. Oh, what happened? It's not showing up there. <coughs> now, this is this is a topic that fascinated me in the '90s, and I did a lot of work and uh, learned a lot of things. Um, None of you are kind of exploring this right now, maybe except Rupesh did a little bit on uh, uh, the sphere, yeah, yeah. Um, but there is always an opportunity for you to kind of uh, keep looking for this kind of nonlinear phenomena in systems that you simulate. But one of the things that you will learn is that you need to begin with a high degree of symmetry in the problem. And then the symmetries are kind of spontaneously broken, giving rise to these complicated nonlinear multiple states. Uh, but when you're talking about a full dynamical system, that is the trajectory of uh, a solution that is evolving in time, most often you have only a unique solution for that kind of a trajectory. Um, because as I said, for ODEs, there is a theory that says that the solution is unique for a given initial condition as long as the function is continuous. Now, if you go to navier stokes equation, those conditions are not necessarily satisfied. So, we could have complications arising out of the uh, nonlinearity of such systems. Uh, but for well-behaved systems, now, if you take navier stokes equation or any partial differential equation, is it a dynamical system? Of course it is, okay? but the, it, it is a partial differential equation. So, the way that we access the solution is truncating the spatial variables and converting them into a system of ordinary differential equations. Then using this system theoretic approach to interpret the results. Okay, so you can look at it as a system of ordinary differential equations derived from a partial differential equation. So you are truncating what essentially is an infinite dimensional system, a continuous system, to a finite dimensional system. So there are errors introduced in that truncation. And so the question is how realistic is this in terms of capturing the dynamics of uh, true partial differential equation. But Lorentz model is a highly truncated version of navier stokes equation, just three ordinary differential equations derived from uh, navier stokes equation. I will give you a few examples of those as we go along. Okay? But one of the things is, I, I, I don't really necessarily expect you to, something wrong? Of course something is wrong because I didn't connect you. <laughs> I don't expect you to kind of spend a lot of time reading these unless you come across some interesting phenomena you want to pursue this on your own. 
then we can work together to dig deeper. I think one that uh, Richard brought to our attention is the flow between two rotating cylinders, like the rotating disks. Uh, particularly if you put particles on there, what kind of uh, uh, dynamical behavior are possible or the steady states, multiple steady state possible. That problem would be very rich in that. So I want you to kind of think about these things and uh, ask questions, but not necessarily spend a lot of time reading about it. But thinking about it, discussing among yourselves, or bringing it to this session would be helpful. Now we saw this example uh, in the last class, the wire example, where it showed that it is a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation. Now, what is a supercritical uh, bifurcation? Um, The diagram that we drew was something like this. So, and then this becomes unstable. That still exists as a solution. So, because it moves forward, you call this as a supercritical bifurcation. In the book by Drayson, I was just looking at it last night, he has a figure for the same system. This example, he also attributes it to Benjamin. Uh, who originally proposed this, but he has a picture like this, okay, and what happens here is as you increase that length, you go along this path and that's a stable solution, and at some critical value LC, it switches to this, jumps, solution jumps, and then that, if you continue to increase this, you will follow this path as a stable solution, but this solution remains a solution, but an unstable solution, but when you start with a state here and then start decreasing it, decreasing the length, going back, it doesn't snap back at the same position, okay. So it continues here and then snaps back at this position, a second critical point. So this you would call as a fold, fold bifurcation, whereas this one is a pitchfork, but it's called a subcritical pitchfork because locally what happens is you have one solution across this, another solution giving you a fork-like behavior but it's subcritical. Below the critical value, you have three solutions. Above the critical value, you have only one solution in the neighborhood of that singularity. Okay. So this would be called a subcritical bifurcation. Now, which one would you observe when you do that experiment would depend on the strength of material of that particular uh, rod that you are using. Okay. If it is very stiff, you may find a supercritical one. If it has some less degree of stiffness, you may find a subcritical type of bifurcation where the critical points forward and backward are not the same. And this would be called a hysteresis behavior. There are two different paths that it follows. Okay. And when you perturb that system, this is again a structurally unstable system. So when you perturb that system with a second parameter like a tilt, the way that it unfolds may be that this path gets connected to the bottom one, like here. Okay, and that path gets connected to the forward one. That one gets connected to the forward one, something like this. Okay, so once again, if you notice, as we perturb the system, this broke up, but this remains the same. Still, the fold remains a stable. So, fold is a structurally stable uh, bifurcation structure that appears in both the places, but the pitchfork is a structurally unstable structure. If you put up the second parameter, it will uh, unfold into a different structure. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, I was struggling with this figure drawing last time, but this figure is also here in the book by Drazen. Okay. Nonlinear system. So here it shows the solution to. A dynamical system, you have to think of this as dx dt equals something like this. That is your dynamical system, but we are looking at the steady state behavior. So we set this equal to zero. So the function equal to zero and it has two parameters a and b, very similar to the length and the angle that we talked about. And it has a cubic nonlinearity. Okay, two cubic nonlinearity, two parameters. And when you solve the system, for example, for fixing uh, a equal to 0 and varying b. That means you are constructing the solution on this plane. Okay, And you might get a curve like this. What does that curve represent? Those are the values of x, the state, where the function is equal to 0. So you are going to fix the value of a 
Okay, fix the value of A and continuously change the value of B. So B becomes your distinguished parameter that you're going to change and then solve this equation for X. So plot X versus B and you get one curve. Then redo the same thing by changing A to the next value and reconstruct that graph. So if you do that and stack all those graphs, you will get a series of curves like this. And if your A is somewhere here, you will actually get, for, for example, for a value of A, you will get a curve like this. And that shows a hysteresis kind of a behavior. So in B, as you come across this, it will snap to the bottom one. As you decrease B, it will snap back. But there is an intermediate solution that is unstable. Okay, but these are all folds. So if you change A to another value, you might get another curve like that. Okay, and it's going to go back and come down. But as you decrease A, for example, there is a critical point where there is an inflection point, meaning these two limit points come close together and merge. Okay, and that is what we call the cusp, cusp point. Okay, so if you take the projection projection of where this fold is and where the other fold is okay onto the parameter space okay there is a b the projection onto the a b plane you will get a set of parameters so if your parameters are within this domain you're going to have three solutions if the parameters are outside of the domain you're going to have only one distinct solution okay this kind of a classification is uh, is the basic purpose of a bifurcation study or a catastrophe theory study. Uh, there was a, in the 60s and 70s, I think, in Scientific American, I remember as a graduate student reading an article about using catastrophe theory to explain everything. Basically, they were saying, well, we could explain the stock market, the bull market and the bear market. So the competition between these two and the change in the market, catastrophic collapse of the market from one to the other is all can be explainable with this kind of a behavior and maybe there is some element to it but the problem is you cannot predict it. The real purpose of this thing would be to map out this parameter region and to say when you cross this threshold you are going to have a collapse. Okay, And that's not possible to predict with uh, financial models or with models dealing with uh, natural biological systems. Uh, but for physical systems certainly it can be done. This has been done a chemical reactor model. So whenever you can write a model that the key is there. So if you can write this model and have a high degree of confidence in this model that it captures some physical phenomena, then you have powerful ability to analyze that model and identify where you will have regions of multiplicity, regions of stability and uh, that's the basic idea behind this nonlinear analysis. Okay, any questions? Don't be just passive observing. This is the only time you should be active. I'm not expecting you to read and spend a lot of time outside of it, but think and ask questions. Asking questions certainly helps. Okay. How we can relate this to a severe problem? Well, in the in the sphere problem, the dynamics is such that the control parameter is your announcement. As you are increasing your, there are several variations on that. It's still a complex problem, not fully understood. Okay, so if I fix a sphere in space and have a flow past it, then what happens is the flow because the lower Reynolds number it's unique, it's linear. Okay, the flow remains uh, unique, and at a certain Reynolds number you have this wake formation, and even in that region, people have not computed multiple solutions. It remains unique. Okay, but the first sign of instability is uh, when this axisymmetric two-dimensional solution loses stability, and when that happens, what else can form? That's a question one can ask. You can have a three-dimensional stationary solution, or you can have a three-dimensional time-dependent solution. The evidence suggests right now that it forms a three-dimensional time-dependent solution. The same thing you can ask about a cylinder. The cylinder problem is much more studied and well understood than the sphere problem. So if you have a fixed cylinder and the same thing flow past this, at a Reynolds number of uh, 40 or 50 or something like that, you will have the one common vortex shedding. Okay? So that's basically a time periodic solution with a very definite period. So it occurs at what you call a Hopf bifurcation, which I'm going to talk about soon. 
okay uh, in sphere problem that number has been calculated i think around 130 or 230 or something like that okay, okay. 210 now that that was done by agravas for a fixed sphere okay now the problem becomes completely different when you have a sphere that is settling okay when it is settling it's free to interact with the fluid but at about the same Reynolds number, the same phenomena could, should occur. And when that happens, the fluid that is shared becomes time dependent. So it imposes a time dependent motion on the particle. Now the particle is free to move. Here, the same forces will exist on the particle, but by applying a resistive force, we are taking care of it. We are not letting, letting it move. So if I have a sensitive instrument that measures these forces, I should actually be able to see what the force is exerted by the fluid on the particle, but I'm still not letting it move. Whereas the dynamics of when the particle is settling, which is what you did, is more interesting because now it can begin to wobble, it can begin to, and there are a lot of experiments where it says if you have a, part, a particle that is rising, for example, the light one, all of a sudden it will start going in one direction. Okay, why does it do that? So there is a critical phenomena there that occurs. It's breaking of the symmetry. Once again, you need that. Breaking of the symmetry is what is needed to go on to other states which are non symmetric. Okay, and there, Breaking of axis symmetry is a particularly challenging problem because when it breaks axis symmetry, for example, in this case, I have a sphere that is settling and all of a sudden it starts migrating in one way. Why does it pick that way? Why does it go at the same angle at a different location is a good question to ask. And in fact, it does. The experiments show that it can take any one of the 360 degrees. And that depends on the initial perturbations that I put. But once it chooses the angle, it goes at the same angle for that kind of a particle, so that parameter set, settling velocity, density, ratio, etc. But angle of inclination may be different as you change the parameter. Yeah. So that's a very rich area still for studying in terms of. Yeah, yeah. So we change the angle of the grid. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. With that angle, right. With that angle. right. So, so I think that is the one parameter. Oh, well, it's not strictly a parameter in the problem. It's a perturbation that we yeah, put. Perturbation. It's a perturbation that we put on the system. So we're perturbing the grid in any, in any way. We can make it choose one of those. And there, which one does it choose? One can do a normal mode analysis to kind of predict what, what which stage will evolve from there. I think we'll, maybe if there is time, we will talk about those things as we go along. Yeah. If we increase the grid size, no, no, no. That's that's also a good question. Um, these critical points that we are talking about uh, are basically features of the solution for that particular equation. Now, in this case, the model doesn't have any uncertainty. Suppose this is an algebraic model. It's a true model. I can actually analytically calculate all of these things. But if it is coming from approximation of a differential equation, there is an error that is introduced in the discretization. That's a discretization error. So what happens is these critical points depend on the grid size. And again, people have looked at how sensitive are these the grid, uh, the bifurcation points to the grid. Okay, the Keller, J.B. Keller, I think from Caltech has done a lot of work on this one. And so you need to make sure that these critical points are also grid independent. So they will become grid independent either quadratically as h squared, h is your grid size, or h linearly. So that tells you how to extrapolate. If you get the critical point as a function of three different grid sizes, you can plot them. And if you know from theoretical analysis how that varies quadratically or linearly, you can then project and say for infinite small grid size, what should be the critical point, which should be the critical point for the actual partial differential equation. Okay, But you cannot treat that h as a parameter, well you can treat that as a parameter on the discrete problem, but what we really want to understand is how does the continuous problem behave. So we need to do this kind of an extrapolation to get at the actual answer. Is that what you are asking? Grid, the grid dependence? Yeah, I think so. That means uh, if there is no yeah. Oh, that's a different question. Yeah. You, you don't control the disturbance by grid alone. Okay. You control the disturbance. So in numerical simulation, the disturbances come from round off others. Yeah. 
because you are doing the calculation in finite precision, 7 digits, 8 digits or 14 digits. So, the random round of error that is introduced when you are doing in a dynamical sense, okay, so will be the natural source of disturbance in a numerical simulation. In a physical experiment, it will be the fan, the vibrations, whatever that is, will be the source of uh, disturbance. And if you quell all those disturbances, then you can have the path going straight in the sphere case, okay. And there is actually a very nice uh, presentation given by Tom Mullen. Um, he is, I think, at, uh, he was at Oxford University. He was a student of Benjamin, I think. And very recently, there was a lecture series in honor of Benjamin. And this actually, I, I downloaded that presentation. So he talks about this transition in pipe flow. It's yeah, still an unresolved problem. Right? So up to 10,000, 20,000, they are able to observe uh, lamina flow. And he talks about the nonlinear dynamical stability implications of that in the presentation. I downloaded that and put it in the drop box in the case I'm interested. So on that situation, the solution is in this right and stable mode. Yeah, so there the none of the more unstable modes are excited. If you don't, if you have that situation, the even even though if you have disturbances, but the disturbances do not perturb or activate the unstable modes then you might still have uh, a stable response. But if you have any arbitrary disturbance, the chances are that some of the modes will affect the unstable mode and then that will cause it to grow, grow away. And uh, okay, I'll talk about these modes, modal analysis in a simple conceptual uh, setup, uh, hopefully, hopefully today, okay, that will give you an idea. So there are a lot of concepts, I think, that's what I want you to get at, not necessarily the mathematical details of how you do it, you have to get there if you're going to actually do it, but the conceptual understanding I think is very important. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's get into how we determine the stability. Okay, so I have a dynamical system. This is a very simple, trivial, ordinary differential equation. Okay, dy dt equals lambda y. Lambda is a constant, so it's a linear system with an initial condition that y0 equal to 1. The solution to that is y equal e to the power lambda t. You can very easily verify this. Take this and plug it in there and you will get the equation being satisfied. Okay. And when t equal to 0, you get y0 equal to 1. The question is, if is that solution stable? How do we answer that question? Okay. And that depends on, we call this as the eigenvalue in the problem, the lambda as the eigenvalue. So if the real part of that eigenvalue is negative, then the solution is stable. Okay, that's a basic idea, okay? Because the e to the power negative number as time t goes to infinity will decay, okay? So, <clears throat> if you have a higher dimensional system, dy where I have a vector, dy dt equals f of y, how do I answer whether such a system is going to be stable or not? We have so far ex explored the is issues of what do we mean by solutions to that. One is the solution to the dynamical system, which is the trajectory, the other one is solution to the steady state system, which are equilibrium points, okay. So, uh, what if you find the equilibrium points, can we say anything about the stability of those equilibrium points? Um, in addition to this notion of a linear stability for a linear system, which I just showed you, and the answer for that is, you actually need to be able to solve the system and get all the eigenvalues, and if all the eigenvalues, the negative, the real part of the eigenvalues, all of them, or negative, then you have a stable system, linearly stable for the linear system. Uh, there is another concept called the Lyapunov stability proposed by a Russian mathematician, also for a dynamical system, okay, x dot equals f of x t with an initial condition. This I took from uh, Wikipedia. Now, you all know what an autonomous system is, right, autonomous nonlinear system. No? The autonomous system is one where you don't have explicitly uh, the function depending on t. So, if I have an equation x dot equals f of x comma t, okay, then I would call as a non-autonomous system because t explicitly appears in the function, okay. But there is a simple mathematical trick that you can use to convert non-autonomous system to autonomous system by defining an extra, extra variable and extending the system, okay. So, let's just focus on autonomous system and autonomous system simply means that x dot, the function depends only on x, the state, 
not on time in the parade. So you don't have external forcing that you change with time, for example. There's no control action. So these are systems, essentially autonomous means independent, right? So I don't have an external control action on the system, then it's going to evolve independently, determined by its own dynamical nature, okay? So th this is a mathematical definition. When I see something like this, I'm not a mathematician. I always get confused and I go to mathematicians to help me explain that. Luckily in my life, I have had two mathematicians working with me. One was Hubert Wynischke from Germany. He taught me a lot about mathematical phenomena. The other one is Peter Minet about the mathematical ideas behind the algorithms development. Okay. So what does it say? It says that there is that we are assuming that there is an equilibrium point. We are going to call the equilibrium point as xc. What is an equilibrium point? I set f of x equal to 0 and I solve for x. And it could be multidimensional, okay, n-dimensional equations. I have n equations. So this equilibrium point is a point in an n-dimensional state space. Always think of two. Okay, whenever thinking of state space, you have x1 and x2 or y1 and y2, I would call a point in that, which is a solution in the state space. And the equivalent version of it is uh, an n-dimensional system. What it says is that there exists a delta. The delta depends on an epsilon. Okay, for every epsilon that I arbitrarily pick, there exists a delta such that x0 minus xc is more than delta. What does it mean? My initial condition x0 must be close enough to the equilibrium solution so that the difference, the norm of the difference, so if this is xe, I must be near that x0 and the norm would be the distance, how far I am. Okay. And the, if that is less than delta, that is, if I'm sufficiently close to the equilibrium point, okay, so that I can always find a delta and I put a circle. So anywhere, if that is my delta. Anywhere in that region, if my initial condition is there, then if xt minus xe is less than epsilon for every t greater than zero, what does that mean? That is the trajectory, trajectory of the solution starting from some point inside this, that is a trajectory that wanders, okay. It may never reach the equilibrium point, but it wanders and I can put a bound on that. So I can put another region epsilon so that the solution is bounded within that epsilon. Plain English, what does it mean? It means if I remain close enough to an, if I start from a close enough to an equilibrium point, I remain close enough to the equilibrium point forever. Then I call such systems as stable. It's a definition. It's a definition of what stability is, but it's a more general definition, okay. For example, this will allow us to classify a limit cycle, a closed trajectory. So there is no equilibrium point, but the trajectory in the two-dimensional state space is a closed cycle. So that remains closed. I can put a bound, epsilon, around, around that limit cycle and it remains in the limit cycle. So it will be classified as a stable point. So it's an equilibrium point. So it's a generalization of this notion of what stability is. The system. So if the system blows out, I cannot bound, I cannot bound this, I cannot find an epsilon such that the trajectory just keeps on evolving, then it's an unstable system. Typical explosions, nuclear explosions, chemical explosions would all be unstable systems because they just run away chemical reactions are examples of unstable systems. Okay. So for stability, if I start close enough, I must remain close enough. Okay. Then we call that system as stable. And then there is a variation on that, that is asymptotic stability. You can imagine what that would be. It will not, it will, it should not only be remain bounded, but it should asymptotically go towards the equilibrium point as time goes to infinity. Okay. And that's what we mean by this statement. As t goes to infinity, the trajectory difference between the equilibrium point goes to zero. Okay. The norm of that goes to zero. The exponential stability is a variation on that, it says it not only goes to zero, but it goes to zero in an exponential fashion. Okay. That means that the trajectory is always bounded. This is from the initial point. Okay. From the initial, how far from the initial point, it should go to zero in an exponential way. That means I can find a beta such that I can fit the trajectory. Okay. And this is what I mean. And now these are ge definitions are general for any nonlinear system. We are not linearizing it. We are not making any other condition. So they are very general and powerful definitions 
um, but it subsumes, that is the linear stability would be part of this. For example, this is what we mean. In a linear stability, we always find an eigenvalue that goes exponentially to zero uh, if, from, the, from the equilibrium point. Yeah. Um, in this case, epsilon is a perturbation. Uh, epsilon is not a perturbation. Epsilon is a region in state space. It's a region in state space. Think of it as a hypersphere. Okay. So that's greater than zero. So it's not a perturbation of the dynamical system. We are not talking about perturbing the dynamical system. We are talking about you give me the dynamical system, you give me an initial condition. The moment you give me the initial condition, I can um, find how far I am from that initial condition. Right. Okay. And I can put a bound around that. That means I can find a delta. The moment you give me an initial condition, the initial condition, I know the equilibrium point. I can find a delta. Okay. And then. If I can also find for the entire solution, if I can also find a region epsilon that remains bounded, then I would call such systems as stable systems. Now, there's no there's no statement there that says that epsilon can be larger than delta. So uh, no, if no. you start inside, you could actually go outside and right. then go into a limit. That's cycle, correct. That's, that's correct. still stable. That's still stable, and that often happens. For example, when you have a Limit cycle. A limit cycle, as I said, is uh, a closed trajectory. Right. Okay. I could start from inside that, and the trajectory will just go and merge. Okay. Or I could start outside of that, and the trajectory will come and merge on that. Right. Okay. So I could have delta larger or smaller than epsilon. Okay. And in the the last exponentially stable, alpha and beta are just part of the definition. They're not parameters of the, the system? Um, yeah, the, 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 they are all numbers that we can find. Okay. okay, that's what it says. So the delta already been introduced as a number that we can find. Okay, so in here, we want to say that the distance is proportional. Okay, right. okay? and the proportionally constant is alpha. So we are saying that we can find an alpha, a number, uh, which, so it can scale up. Okay. But the important point is with time, it should go exponentially down. So we should also be able to find a beta that will respond in that particular fashion. All these definitions are beautiful, but it doesn't help us to tell whether a given system is stable, asymptotically stable, <laughs> or not. <laughs> right? So. Are there any overlapping regions in the sense that we can, for the same initial condition, we can end up with either of? That's a good question. For a same initial condition, that rules out because remember the first theorem that we saw is for a given initial condition, the trajectory is unique. So you cannot have two different trajectories. Okay. So um, that also you can kind of, uh, well, I guess uh, I, I'll come to that later on. If you give an initial condition, you cannot have two paths, two tangents evolving from that initial condition. That is ruled out and that in fact rules out forming more complex structures in a two-dimensional plane. There's something called Poincare of Index and Theorem that says that you can have at most a limit cycle in a two-dimensional problem. So you need at least a three-dimensional problem to have chaotic uh, attractors and stuff like that. Um, but for a given initial condition, the trajectory has to be unique uh, towards its equilibrium position, which could be a steady state or it could be a limit cycle. Yeah. <coughs> two equations. Two no, 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 no. That's a good point too. I should not confuse you. The parameter space can have its own dimensionality. Okay. So you can have two parameters, three parameters, four parameters, then we'll call them as two dimensional, three dimensional, four dimensional parameter space. Okay. I'm talking about state space. The state space refers to the unknowns x dx dt equals f. What is the dimension of x? How many elements are there in the vector? Okay, so if you have two unknowns in a differential equation, two equations and two unknowns, it will be a two-dimensional state space. Uh, that's what I mean. Okay, not the parameter space. There is an English translation of that also in uh, Wikipedia. Now. We saw that we can calculate the stability if you know the solution by calculating the eigenvalues and eigenvectors directly and then checking the sign of the eigenvalues. But the Lyapunov's contribution was not only with general, providing a very general framework for defining stability, but also 
determining whether a stability a system is dynamic a system is stable without solving it, without having to know. And that's a very powerful tool, very powerful contribution because nonlinear systems are notoriously difficult to solve. In like a linear system, there is a recipe that you can go through and you can construct a solution. For nonlinear systems, there is no general recipe that allows you to construct an analytical solution. Okay? Numerically, you can explore it, but analytically, you cannot do that. So, what he proposed and he proved this theorem was basically to determine the stability of a dynamical system, nonlinear dynamical system. You don't need to know the solution, you just have to construct a test function. And people later on have given this test function physical meaning. It would be typically some sort of an energy function. Okay, and uh, the idea is that the energy function at the equilibrium point in the state space must have a parabolic shape. Okay, so this is the very same idea that we saw at the beginning with, with a parabola and the sphere in there. If you perturb it, it's stable. So if you can construct a function again in mathematical terms, v of x, which is positive definite, meaning at x equal to zero, v is zero. For any other x in the neighborhood of x e, the equilibrium state, the function is always positive, it's going up. Okay? This is true in any multidimensional system. So x could be 20 or 200. If you can construct a scalar function, a scalar function of v, which is a function of the vector, okay, you can construct a such a function that's positive definite and its derivative, its total derivative is negative definite. Okay, then such systems are stable for that particular equilibrium point. Okay, and that's a powerful result. But the catch is if you can construct it, okay, you cannot always construct that function for any given nonlinear dynamical system. Okay. People have explored that for a number of years and uh, Number of people, particularly in chemical engineering that I know, and I think it's happened in electrical too, uh, people find ways of constructing this function and then test whether it remains as negative definite. And what you will find is you will find that it remains de negative definite in a certain region of the state space. Then you say it is stable in that region. And you call that region as your region of attraction. Meaning if you start anywhere in that region, you will be attracted to that state. Okay. So, there are a lot of papers on constructing that uh, level of stability, but for, for non-dissipative system, conservative systems, you can construct something called a Hamiltonian and that will have a lot of these properties. Okay. So, there are certain classes of physical systems, I think, where you can construct this, but not in a general way. So, there is no uh, general way of constructing this for any uh, nonlinear problem. Okay, so, so for any given nonlinear dynamical system dy dt equals f of y, the dv dt, the derivative, the total derivative of the function, because v is a function of the state, so we can take the gradient of that and then dot it with, so basically I am applying the chain rule. Okay, so I am saying dv dt is equal to dv dy times dy dt. But dv dy, v is a scalar, but y is a vector in the multidimensional case. So that is going to be your gradient function, gradient of that v. Okay, and that's what this is. And dy dt is nothing but f. And that's where the dynamical information gets fed in into that function. Once you construct that function, you check whether it is negative definite. So you construct the function, make sure when you're constructing the function, make sure that it is positive definite. And then calculate this quantity and check whether it is negative definite and if it is true then you will have guaranteed stability. If this is true for all of the state space it is globally stable but if it is true for a finite region of the state then it is uh, locally uh, stable okay? uh, in, the in the sense of uh, layout mode. So here is an example, two, two dimensional example, y prime equals z and z prime equals minus y minus z. So two ordinary differential equations. My vector, state space vector consists of y and z. Okay. So this equation can be put in a matrix form. Okay. So this is your state space, y and z is your state space and here is a, it's a linear system. So we don't really need Lyapunov system to understand the stability. What, what do we need? All we need is pass this matrix to EIG in MATLAB, which puts out all the eigenvalues 
the two eigenvalues are minus 1 and minus 1. Okay? So it is a stable system. We know that already. But the example illustrates how we apply the Lyapunov method. Okay? So we construct a V as a function of the state, y and z in this case, which is quadratic. Why do we need it to be quadratic? We need it to be positive definite. So whether y is positive or negative, z is positive or negative, we are squaring it. Okay? So this is going to be a positive definite function for sure. And then we calculate dv dt. Okay? And we do that by the method that I just told you, that is take the first function, take its derivative with respect to y and z, and then the same thing with the second one, and take the dot product of that with f. And you will find that you get this equation, which simplifies because you can cancel plus y z and minus y z. So you get minus 2 z squared. Of course, z squared is positive, so the negative sign is there, so it's negative uh, definite. Okay. So it basically confirms that the system is globally stable for any value of z. That, that's the basic idea of the Lyapunov stability. And the region of attraction, this is an example that I picked. So in this particular example, it's globally stable. Okay, no matter what your initial condition is, it will be attracted. For linear system, that's pretty characteristic. Okay. <coughs> now, that was a linear system. Now we have a nonlinear system, single nonlinear system. Here alpha is a parameter. And z is your initial condition. So I have two numbers, alpha and z, in the solution. But the steady state solution by inspection you can see by setting dy dt equal to 0, y equal to 0 is one solution. Are there other solutions? Obviously there are because it's a cubic, right? Conveniently again by inspection you can tell what would be the other two solutions. But let's just focus on y has equal to 0. Okay. Now the dynamical solution, you Fortunately, there are very few problems where you can develop an analytical solution for not any problem. But in this particular case, I guess it's kind of constructed in such a way that you can uh, build an analytical solution because you can separate and integrate. You can just reduce it into a quadrature. Okay? The analytical solution is given by this. Okay? So the question is, can, do, do you have a solution from this for any value of z? I give you a value of alpha, which is a parameter in the problem. So I give you a number for alpha. The question is, will this? Can you construct the trajectory of this, okay, as a real trajectory in a, in a one-dimensional state space, for any value of z? And the answer to that is, you need to do a little bit of uh, examination of the function. Okay, alpha square is going to be a positive number, so t goes to infinity. Okay, so this is going to be exponentially growing. But luckily for us, it is in the denominator. So the function will go to zero. Okay. That's fine. In that sense, that solution is going to be stable. Okay. But what happens when z is smaller than alpha? That's what you need to look at. So if I pick my initial condition z, the initial condition z, to be smaller than the number that is given in the problem alpha what is going to happen to this quantity? It will become negative, right? But you can say, well, this is still there, okay? So it may still be the total thing may be positive, but we know for sure that this number is going to keep on increasing. So there will come a time when this entire thing will be larger than this. So you'll have a square root of a negative number. So you don't have a real trajectory anymore, okay? So when you are doing this integration numerically, what you will find is, if you pick your z to be larger than alpha, it will not be attracted to that particular solution. In general, you can ask the question, if it is not attracted to that solution, what, what happens? It may be attracted to the other solutions in the problem, or it may go into spontaneous sustained oscillations if it is beyond the half verification point, or it can exhibit a strange chaotic behavior. Those are for two-dimensional and three-dimensional systems. For one-dimensional system, most likely it should go to an equilibrium point. There is no other kind of behavior that is possible. Okay? So that tells you how to precisely calculate the region of attraction. In this case, the region of attraction is such that z must be less than alpha. Your initial condition must be less than alpha. Then it will be attracted to that particular solution. This example is a beautiful example also taken from Drazen. Uh, do you understand that? Any questions? Okay.
I guess we're almost out of time. Two-dimensional systems. Let's just explore the linearization idea. How do I, as I said in the last class, for two-dimensional system, if the degree of nonlinearity is small enough, we basically know everything about uh, how to analyze two-dimensional systems. Okay, qualitatively in terms of limit cycles, there are a lot of theoretical results that tell us whether it's an equilibrium state, or a steady state, or it's a limit cycle. And when does the transition occur, etc. When you go to three dimensions, highly nonlinear system, there's nothing known. We need to explore them only numerically. So let's begin with the two-dimensional system. And given that system, the question is: how do I determine how many solutions there are? Steady state solutions. How do I determine the dynamics? Okay. And uh, how do I determine the stability of that steady state solution? So to determine the steady state solution, I need to set f1 equal to zero and f2 equal to zero. Okay, and solve for that. How do I solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equations? Do you remember any method that you have seen? Newton method is one. It's basically it has to be an iterative method. So you make a guess, plug in the values, and check whether the function is equal to zero. So the Newton method basically says that y p plus one is equal to y p minus j inverse f. <coughs> so from p equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. Okay, so you are making an initial guess p equal to 0, y 0, you make an initial guess for the two numbers y1 and y2, and you put them in here and you calculate the Jacobian and you calculate the function. If the function is 0, that means you have already found the solution, your initial guess is fine. Okay, so it won't be 0 in general, then the Jacobian gives you the correction, the direction in which the tangent vector in a hyperplane in which you should go to meet on the axis where those functions are zero. Okay. So the Jacobian is a very important quantity in nonlinear dynamics, not only in solving steady state solutions, but we'll see that in following the solution paths as you change the parameter and in determining the stability of those each one of those equilibrium solutions, all the information is contained in J. Now if you look at the packages like uh, fluent it doesn't construct, it doesn't use direct method, it uses other iterative methods, it doesn't use the neutral method. Comsol actually does. There is an option for using a direct method and when you choose that, Comsol will construct J. If we can access that J, then we can actually probe the stability issues. We can ask, calculate the eigenvalues and see whether the eigenvalues change sign or not when you can calculate the steady state solutions. So some tools are quite powerful in the sense that you, you need to have access to the full Jacobian calculation, not an approximate one, but an actual analytical one. Okay, so the linearization basically gives you that. What does the linearization tell us? We have basically says that y one, uh, y one, uh, is written as y one steady state plus y one perturbation, which is a function of time. Similarly for y two, I'm just doing it for two dimensional case. But you should be able to do this for like two point t. So these are the steady state values that I obtain from Newton method, for example, an equilibrium point in the two-dimensional state space. And these are the perturbations. Okay. So to answer the stability, once I find a steady state solution by solving this using the Newton method and put that in the state space, y1, y2. For example, I have one steady state there, one steady state there, one steady state there. Okay, so this is y one s y two s y three s. Now my subscript when I put an underscore it means it's a vector. Okay, one two three refers to three different steady states there. Okay, so I want to know each whether each one of these steady states is stable or not. So I need to perturb this system and develop. Uh, with that, I guess I will wrap today. Okay, so I take this and plug it into the left-hand side. So I will get uh, d y one prime d t equals. Okay, because when I put this on the left-hand side, y one s is a constant. So when I take the derivative, it disappears. Okay, so all I have is d one y one prime d t. On the right-hand side, I'm going to have f one, but evaluated at this point. Okay, so I can write this as f1 evaluated at y1 s plus y1 prime comma y2 s plus y2 prime. Okay, 
Here I am going to linearize the function. That means I am going to write this in Taylor series. So I am going to write this as f at y1 s comma y2 s plus df1 dy1 multiplied by y1 prime plus df1 dy2 multiplied by y2 prime plus the higher order terms which I am going to neglect. That's what the linearization is. Taylor series will have y1 prime square, y2 prime square, y1 prime, y2 prime, all those terms. I'm going to neglect all of them. And this is going to be equal to 0 by definition because those are the steady states. And I do the same thing for the second equation, dy2 prime dt as equal to f2 at y2s, sorry, y1s, y2s plus df2 dy1 multiplied by y1 prime plus df2 dy2 multiplied by y2 prime plus the higher order terms. Okay. Once again, this is equal to 0. So, I can write this in a vector matrix form as dy prime dt equals this matrix multiplied by y1 prime y2 prime and this matrix contains the partial derivatives. Okay. So, it is going to be df1 dy1 df1 dy2 df2 dy1 df2 dy2. Because you know the functions f1 and f2 explicitly as functions of y1 and y2, you need to take these derivatives analytically. And when you do this for Navier-Stokes equation, it becomes pretty messy to be able to do that. But if you want to do proper verification analysis, you should be able to compute the Jacobian because you need the Jacobian in getting the steady state, but you also need the Jacobian in calculating the stability, the same Jacobian in calculating the stability. So now, how do you calculate the stability of this linearized system? Okay, so here I have a vector dy dt prime equals a times y prime vector matrix. What is the solution to this look like? It's a linear system, right? You can find the eigenvalues. So the solution to that is going to be something like y prime of t is going to be some sort of a vector y uh, 0 e to the power lambda 1 t plus y uh, I, I, let me call it y1 e to the y2 e to the power lambda 2 t. Okay. y1 or y2 are called the eigenvectors. Okay. And lambda 1 or lambda 2 are the eigenvalues. So, for this matrix j, we need to actually calculate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. There may be a constant here alpha 1 and alpha 2. Okay. That is how the solution will look like. For any linear ordinary differential equation, you can construct a solution like this. So, once again, for stability, we need lambda 1 and lambda 2, the real part to be negative. Okay. Now, we talked about modes before. Remember that. Okay. So, these are ca also called the modes. Lambda 1 is a mode, lambda 2 is a mode, for example. So, in a two-dimensional state space, y1, y2, I have an equilibrium point that I am interested in studying. So, at that equilibrium point, I calculate j. So, this j or this a, the, the Jacobian matrix will have in it y1 and y2, right? Do you follow that? So, I need to calculate that matrix at a particular equilibrium state. So, if I have three equilibrium states, one here, one there, one there, for each one of them, I have to calculate this explicitly. They will be different. And once I have constructed that eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I can plot those eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, this may be E1, this may be E2, the two eigenvectors locally. Okay? Those are just vectors that you calculate here. I guess I should also have called this E1 and E2, maybe eigenvectors. Okay? So, I can plot these eigenvectors locally at that steady state point. So, if I start in the state space somewhere in the neighborhood. If these two eigenvalues are negative, then the trajectory will go towards that. Okay. So, which path it follows depends on where I place my initial condition. Suppose I place my initial condition on this eigenvector. What would happen? What would be the trajectory? The trajectory would be along this eigenvector. What happens is when I calculate these two, alpha 1, alpha 2 are going to depend on the initial condition. 
So, if I place my initial condition on one of the eigenvectors, that constant will be non-zero, the other constant will be zero. That means, I pick my condition in such a way that it does not contain any component of the mode 2. So, it is on mode 1, so the path is going to be straight in there. But if my, R, if my initial condition is arbitrary, somewhere there, it, it both contains E1 and E2, because E1 and E2 now forms the new basis for representing any arbitrary vector. Okay? So, somewhere here, it will contain both components. So, the trajectory will follow somewhere as a weighted combination of these. I tell you one, with that, I will, with the last question, I will stop. Lambda 1 is smaller than lambda 2, much, much smaller than lambda 2. Okay? So, this one corresponds to lambda 1, this one corresponds to lambda 2. Lambda 1 is much smaller than lambda 2. And I have a point here, initial point, which consists of both modes. Okay? So, both alpha 1 and alpha 2 are non-zero. Which way would the path approach to the equilibrium point? Lambda 2 is very high, right? So, and it is negative. So, it is going to go to 0 very quickly. Okay? So, the trajectory will be something like this. Lambda 2 component will be driven to 0. Lambda 1 component will go to 0 very slowly. Okay? So, the trajectory will approach in a tangential fashion like this. Okay? So, no matter where I start, it will be like this. If I start here, it will be like this. If I start there, it is going to be like that. Okay. So, the magnitude of lambda determines what is the local trajectory. Now, this would be called an attractor. If one of the eigenvalues is positive and the other one is negative, what happens to the instability of the system? It is unstable. Right? Now, how would the trajectory look like in that case? Okay. Let me redraw that graph. Okay, so, I have two eigenvectors E1 and uh, E2, okay, but one is positive and one is negative. Okay? Uh, let us fix ideas, lambda 1 is negative and lambda 2 is positive. Lambda 2 is positive means that that component is going to grow away as time goes to infinity. Okay? The second part is going to grow away. So, the trajectory will actually be going away along this, but it will be an attractor along E1. So, if you start anywhere, it might go towards that, but eventually it will go away. Okay? It will not be attracted to that. So, it will be an unstable. If both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are negative, it is a repeller, totally a repeller. So, it will go away from that uh, no matter where you start. Now, to answer your question, I think that you asked, I have a system where lambda 1 is positive, lambda 2 is negative. Right? But, I take my initial condition and place it in such a way that I am here, exactly on this. What would happen to the trajectory? So, I have suppressed the unstable mode by choosing my initial condition. So, it is going to be attracted to this. Now, if there are no disturbances, it will remain stable. But the slightest disturbance, the repeller will, that means there is a component of the second eigenvector that is activated, then it becomes uh, repeller along that line. Okay? So, when you have multiple modes like this, it is in principle possible, I guess, to maintain the state if you do not excite that particular unstable mode. Okay? And all these things have parallels in a continuous system in terms of uh, Fourier modes. The Fourier analysis does the same thing. We are putting different frequencies and it may be stable to some frequencies and stable to other frequencies. But for guaranteed stability, you need all the modes to be stable. Okay? That is the basic idea of, in an, in an intuitive way, uh, the model analysis. Okay? Any questions? Maybe that is a place we should stop today. Two eigenvalues, the equal to 